While this installation video focuses on traditional vinyl siding, it is important to note that manufacturers continue to offer innovative options. For example, polymer shake and shingle panels come in single, double, or triple course panels. In general, this applications of these panels will take more time to install than conventional horizontal and vertical clapboard siding would take. These panels can be used as a cladding for complete homes or can be used as an accent for clapboard siding. It is a common panel used in the gables or on the dormers. In some cases, these panels must be installed left to right or only right to left. It is therefore critical with shake and shingle panels that you contact the individual manufacturer to verify the details for application. Another growing option is to install vinyl siding with rigid insulating foam. There are several ways installation can be integrated into a vinyl siding system. One method is to attach foam sheathing to the wall before the siding is installed. Foam sheathing comes in many types and thicknesses, but is generally flat, allowing it to be installed with any vinyl siding profile. A second method is to add contoured foam that is custom cut by the manufacturer to fit the shape of the siding panel. Using contoured insulation has a lot of benefits. Not only does it add insulation value, but it also provides more structure and strength to the siding panel, allowing for wider profiles. Contoured insulation can be permanently bonded to vinyl siding during the manufacturing process to create insulated vinyl siding. Contoured insulation can also be used as a drop-in product that is placed behind the vinyl siding during installation. When insulated vinyl siding is installed, it is important to utilize the manufacturer's suggested accessories such as J channels, window lineals, and inside and outside corner posts. These accessories have a deeper pocket to accommodate the additional thickness of insulated vinyl siding. It's also important to utilize the manufacturer's required starter strips. Section 1, Getting Started. In this section, we will cover wall preparation, fasteners, fastening techniques, tools, chalk lines, corner posts, and starter strip. Vinyl siding is an exterior cladding for existing structural walls. Vinyl siding should always be applied over some type of backer board, never to uncovered stud walls. In new construction projects, OSB or plywood is commonly used. In some areas, it is acceptable to use a solid foam board as backer board. In this case, siding must be nailed directly into the wood studs. Siding must always be nailed directly into the framing stud or furring, unless the manufacturer's instructions provide different fastening methods. Walls should be covered with a water-resistive barrier, such as house wrap, roofing felt, or other products, if allowed by the building code. Use a water-resistive material to flash the inside and outside corners a minimum of 10 inches on each side. Water-resistive materials include trim coil, roofing felt, or house wrap. In most residing projects, panels are attached to existing wood siding. To prepare the walls, nail down any loose boards and replace all rotten wood. Using foam backer board to level the wall surface is suggested. For all projects, remove protrusions such as gutters and light fixtures. Before you apply anything to the walls, let's review fastener choices, fastening techniques, and tools. For fasteners, you can use aluminum, galvanized steel, or other corrosion-resistant nails, staples, or screws. There are several important rules to remember regarding proper fastening techniques. Unless otherwise indicated, nail in the middle of nail slots. Be sure to drive nails straight and level to prevent distortion and buckling of the panel. Make sure the fastener penetrates a minimum of three-quarters of an inch into framing studs or furring, unless the manufacturer's instructions provide different fastening methods. Never nail tight. 
since vinyl siding panels expand and contract slightly with weather changes and always leave a gap of approximately 1 32nd of an inch between the fastener head and the vinyl siding or about the thickness of a dime. If a nail slot does not allow centering of the nail, use a nail hole slot punch to extend the nail slot. Common vinyl siding installation tools you will need include tin snips, a nail hole slot punch, a snap lock tool, and a zip lock tool. The next step in getting started is establishing chalk lines for the top of the starter strip which locks the first row of siding. Chalk lines can be located level with the lowest point to be sided or aligned with an existing soffit. Corner posts can be installed prior to the starter strip. Measure the length of corner post needed so that it is one quarter inch short of the underside of the eave or soffit and extends three quarters of an inch below where the bottom of the starter strip will be located. Cut the top and bottom nailing hems so they are not visible after the siding has been installed. Position a nail at the top of the uppermost slot on both sides of the corner post so the post will hang from the nails. This is one of the few times the nail goes at the top, not the middle of the slot. Make sure to square the post while nailing. Continue nailing both sides of the corner post 8 to 12 inches apart in the center of the nail slots. Drive nails straight and level and never nail tight. Leave a gap of approximately 1 32nd of an inch, about the thickness of a dime, between the fastener head and the corner post. If more than one length of corner post is required, cut away one inch of the nailing flanges on the top piece. This top piece should overlap the bottom piece by three quarters of an inch, allowing one quarter inch for movement. In some situations, you will want to close off the bottom of the corner post. This can be done by removing the bottom inch of the nail flange and channel from both sides of the post. Now cut and bend the flaps to close off the post. Now you are ready to install the starter strip. Align the top of the starter strip with the chalk line. Leave at least a one quarter inch gap between adjacent pieces of starter strip and where the starter strip meets any corner post. Nail every 10 inches in the middle of the nailing slot. For back siding, the starter strip must be spaced away from the wall to accommodate the thickness of the backing on the siding. Consult the manufacturer's instructions for specific materials or techniques. In certain situations, such as when a wall changes elevation, it might be necessary to use J-channel as a starter strip. Be sure to drill a minimum of 3 16ths of an inch weep holes no more than every 24 inches. Section 2. Preparing Windows and Installing Accessories. In this section, we will cover flashing around windows, aluminum trim coil and the portable field brake, and J-channel around windows, tops of walls, roof lines, and gables. If you are installing and flashing a new window, refer to the window manufacturer's instructions and ASTM E2112, the standard practice for installation of exterior windows, doors, and skylights for the proper flashing installation method for the window type and wall configuration on the project. The following instructions should be used when applying window flashing to a previously installed nail fin window that does not have flashing. Before applying window trim, install flashing on all four sides of the window to ensure that water drains properly around the window. The pieces should be applied first on the bottom, then the sides, and then the top. First apply a continuous bead of sealant to the nailing flange of the sill. The sealant should cover the nails and nail slots. Be sure that the sealant is compatible with the materials of the window, flashing, and water-resistive barrier. Contact the sealant manufacturer for job-specific recommendations. If you are using self-adhering flashing, sealant may not be necessary. Apply a minimum of 9-inch wide horizontal sill flashing level with the bottom edge of the existing window, 
by pressing the flashing into the sealant bead at its top edge. Cut the sill flashing long enough to extend a minimum of 9 inches beyond each jam. Fasten the sill flashing at the bottom and side edges. Use the same sealant technique for the jams of the window. Continue the bead of sealant at the jams vertically, a minimum of 8.5 inches above the head of the window to allow for bedding at the top portion of the jam flashing into the sealant in the next step. Install the jam flashing by pressing the flashing into the sealant beads at the window jams. Extend the bottom edge of the jam flashing approximately one half inch short of the sill flashing edge and extend the top edge approximately eight and a half inches beyond the head of the window where the head flashing will be placed next. Install the head flashing by pressing the bottom edge of the flashing into the sealant bead previously applied across the mounting flange. Extend the ends of the head flashing approximately one inch beyond the jam flashing at each end. Fasten the head flashing into place along the top edge. If a window with exterior casing or brick mold has been installed without flashing, then use the following instruction. Ensure that the exterior casing has been sealed to the exterior sheathing or water-resistive barrier with a good quality sealant. Contact the sealant manufacturer for job-specific recommendations. Cover the exterior casing around the windows with field-formed aluminum trim coil. This is accomplished using flat trim coil and a portable field brake. To start, record measurements of the wood trim on a drawing. Take exact measurements of the required dimensions, including the length. However, when planning the design of the capping, keep in mind that you may have to add 1 32nd of an inch for each inside bend, and extra material might be needed at the ends to help divert water. Next, cut the desired length and width of trim coil with either tin snips or a utility blade. Mark the points where the bends need to be made. Place the mark sheet into the break and form the desired shape. Make sure to cut tabs to help divert water. The formed piece should now fit snugly onto the wood trim. The bottom formed piece should be attached first, followed by the side pieces. Cut a 45 degree miter joint on both ends of the top piece to allow for proper water drainage and for the best appearance. The top piece is always the last piece installed. When nailing trim coil, always use painted aluminum or stainless steel trim nails in less noticeable places. To allow for expansion and contraction, nail holes should be bigger than the nail shank, but smaller than the nail head. Nail holes should be pre-drilled and nails should not be driven so tight as to dimple the aluminum. Rigid head flashing must be sealed to the exterior sheathing and the top of the exterior casing. Cut notches in both ends of the rigid head flashing and bend them down over the sides of the exterior casing. Install the head flashing on top of the exterior casing, covering the head capping. The ends of the rigid head flashing must extend to the outer edges of the exposed legs of the side J-channel. Next, we will show J-channel around windows, doors, and other large openings to receive the siding. First, take exact measurements of the opening. Allow for the width of both side J-channel when cutting the length of the bottom J-channel. The bottom J-channel should be cut and installed first. At the ends of the bottom J-channel, notches should be cut to accept the tabs on the side J-channel. Although J-channel is preferred, a piece of utility trim can be used instead. The side J-channel is installed next. Cut 45-degree miters and tabs in the bottom of the side pieces and both ends of the top piece to allow for proper water drainage and for proper appearance. The top piece is always installed last. Gables and tops of walls might require the use of more than one full piece of J-channel. Make sure not to gap or butt the J-channel. Cut one inch of the nail hem and lip of one J-channel and lap it three quarters of an inch into the other J-channel, leaving a one quarter inch gap. 
When installing J-channel over roof lines, the J-channel must be at least one half inch above the roofing materials to prevent distortion of the J-channel from heat. In certain cases, such as dark shingles on a south or west exposure, metal J-channel is recommended. When installing J-channel at the peak of the gable, butt the two J-channel at the peak and then miter cut the J-channel that overlaps the other. Section 3, Installing Horizontal Vinyl Siding. In this section, we will cover installing panels, fitting siding around fixtures, fitting siding around windows, sidewall flashing at roof lines, finishing at tops of walls, fitting siding around gables and at eaves, and transitioning from horizontal to vertical siding. Vinyl siding is manufactured with identical factory laps on both ends of the panel. This allows overlaps going right to left or from left to right. Laps should face away from the point of greatest traffic. Both ends of panels have a factory notch for lapping. When panels overlap, make sure they overlap one half of the notch at the end of the panel, or about one inch. When measuring and cutting siding, always allow a one quarter inch gap where siding meets corner posts and J channel. Increase this distance to three eighths of an inch when installing siding in temperatures less than 40 degrees Fahrenheit or 4.4 degrees Celsius. Start installing siding on the lowest wall. Lock the first panel into the starter strip and slide it into the corner post. Make sure the panels are fully locked along the length of the bottom but do not force them up tight when fastening. Next, nail the siding a maximum of every 16 inches directly into the framing stud or furring unless the manufacturer's instructions provide different fastening methods. Leave about a 1 32nd of an inch gap between the fastener head and the siding. When siding is nailed properly, you will be able to move each panel side to side. It's a good idea to check that the panels can move. Every five or six courses or rows of panels, check for alignment as you proceed up the wall. Make sure the panels are lining up around both inside and outside corner posts. As you go up the wall, stagger the laps so that no two laps are aligned vertically unless separated by three courses. When you reach the end of a course, you have to cut the panels to fit the wall. Measure the required length, keeping in mind the one inch overlap and the one quarter inch required for the corner post. Avoid using starting or ending panels shorter than 24 inches. Mark a square line and cut the panel with tin snips or a utility knife or with a circular saw. A fine toothed plywood blade installed in reverse direction or a vinyl siding blade can be used to ensure a smoother cut. As you progress up the wall, you must work around fixtures on the wall. Use a commercially available fixture mount to fit the siding around fixtures and other penetrations, following the manufacturer's instructions. Most fixtures are removable, and most manufacturers have two-part systems that can be used. Attach the mount base. As with the window opening, install flashing around the mounts to allow for water drainage. After siding has been installed around the base, the fixture mount cover can then be snapped into place. When cutting around the mount base, make sure to leave a quarter inch to allow for panel movement. Some fixtures are not removable like a hole spigot. You can cut panels to allow for the fixture. Cut an opening at the end of both panels one quarter inch larger than the fixture. Overlap the panels as previously described at the fixture. If you are installing back siding, you might need to build out the fixture to achieve the desired appearance. As the installation progresses up the wall, you will eventually have a course intersect with the bottom of a window. For appearance reasons, you should always plan so that a single piece of siding extends past both ends of the window. Hold the panel under the window and mark the width of the opening. Make sure to allow one quarter inch clearance of the panel for the J channel. 
Take measurements on both sides of the opening to determine the height to cut out of the panel. Cut the panel with tin snips. Use the snap lock punch to place tabs in the cut edge of the panel. Make sure the tabs point outward. Install utility trim or double utility trim into the J-channel on the bottom of the window. The utility trim might need to be shimmed in some situations to maintain the face of the panel at the desired angle. While locking into the lower course, slip the panel around the window and into the utility trim. Or double utility trim. The same cutting technique is used for panels around the top of a window. Utility trim is not required above the window. When a side wall intersects with a roof line, run the siding until the last full course is under the roof section. Cut a diverter from the aluminum trim sheet. The diverter will slip behind the J-channel that is over the roof line and on top of the nail hem of the last course of siding on the sidewall. Then cut the panel and install. An alternative to a diverter is a kickout flashing. A kickout flashing can be created from trim coil. The kickout flashing must be placed underneath the last piece of step flashing in a manner that diverts water into the gutter. You will also have to modify the last course of panels at the top of each wall. Measure the required width for this last piece in several locations at the top of the wall. Make sure to subtract one quarter inch for panel movement. Using these measurements, cut the panel to the desired height. Next, install J-channel. Using the snap lock punch, make tabs in the cut edge of the panel every six inches. Utility trim or double utility trim should be installed into the J-channel at the top of the wall. Install the panel, making sure it locks into the previous course while firmly snapping into the utility trim. This panel, like all others, should be able to move from side to side. You might have to shim the last piece or use a double utility trim to maintain the proper angle for the face of the panel. Another option to finish so off the panels and the way. eave and the gables is to utilize a two-piece snap-in crown system. For gables, like the one shown on this test wall, make sure a water-resistive barrier has been installed. When installing siding panels into a gable, make a pattern for cutting the angles. Lock a short piece of siding into the last full course of panels. Hold a second piece against the J-channel. Now mark the angle onto the first piece of siding. Cut this angle and use it as a pattern for all cuts in the gable area making angle adjustments as needed. The last piece in the gable must be face nailed with a long color match trim nail, except for this instance you should not be face nailing. To transition from horizontal to vertical siding, finish the last course of horizontal siding with J-channel and finish trim or double utility trim. Then install rigid head flashing and J-channel, leaving a small space between the trim and J-channel. The top piece of J-channel must have a minimum of 3 16 of an inch diameter weep holes drilled no more than 24 inches apart to allow for water runoff. Section 4. Installing Vertical Siding In this section, we will cover wall preparation, J-channel, sidewall, flashing, and gables. Vertical siding requires a solid, nailable sheathing. If this is not available, or the surface requires leveling, attach furring strips horizontally every 12 inches. Many of the installation rules for vertical siding are the same as for horizontal siding, with some exceptions. Corner posts should extend one quarter inch below where the J-channel will go. Instead of starter strip at the bottom of the wall, J-channel is used as a bottom receiver. It should be installed in the same way as a horizontal starter strip, except you should drill 3 16 of an inch weep holes through the bottom of the J-channel no more than every 24 inches. J-channel is required on all sides of windows. Utility trim is not to be used on bottoms of openings and vertical siding, but is required on all sides of openings. And at the tops of walls. To determine the number of panels needed for the wall, 
divide the width of the wall by the width of the vertical panel to be used. If either end requires only a partial panel, split the measurement equally on both sides to create a balanced appearance. Install utility trim into one of the corner posts to receive the partial panel. Shimming might be necessary to maintain the face of the panel. Use a snap lock punch to create lugs in the edge of the end panel and install it into the corner post. Install the remaining panels by placing the first nail in the top of the top nail slot instead of the middle. Leave a 1 quarter inch gap at the top of the panels and a 3 8 inch gap at the bottom of the panel to allow for expansion and contraction. It is critical the vertical panels float between the upper and lower J channels. Fasten the panels not more than every 12 inches apart. Remember to nail in the center of the nail slots and do not nail tight. If a wall requires more than one course of vertical siding or there is a transition from horizontal to vertical siding, finish installing the lower siding. Then install rigid head flashing on top of the lower siding accessory by sealing it to the wall and fastening it securely. Rigid head flashing can be purchased or feel formed from trim coil. A piece of J-channel must be used as the bottom receiver for the second course of vertical siding. Drill 3 16ths of an inch weep holes every 24 inches. Install the J-channel at least 1 8th of an inch above the rigid head flashing to allow for water drainage. For gable ends, you can use the balanced method described earlier or you can start at the center of the gable with back-to-back J-channel -back or a transitional channel. The method for determining the angle to cut the vertical siding in the gable end is the same method that was used for horizontal siding. Section 5 Installing Soffit in this section, we will cover receiving channels, transitional channels, soffit, and fascia. Soffit covers the area at the eave of the roof or porch ceilings. Soffit comes in solid, vented, and combination panels in vinyl or aluminum. Vented panels allow critical airflow into the attic area. Consult local building code for the proper amount of ventilation required. Local environmental conditions and building codes, especially in high wind zones, may call for different installation techniques. Always consult the manufacturer's instructions and local building codes for the correct soffit installation techniques. The procedure used to install soffit depends on the construction of the eaves and gable. Open eaves have exposed rafters or trusses and are typical in new construction. Enclosed eaves have soffit already in place and are typical of reciting projects. The first step in installing soffit is to install a soffit receiving channel onto the wall. The channel must be applied level to the bottom of the fascia board. For open eaves, an F channel can be installed directly to the wall or a wood block strip can be used for installing J channel. You can also cut tabs in the nailing hem of a J-channel and attach this modified channel by nailing into the tabs. For enclosed eaves, J-channel can be attached directly to the existing wood soffit. Using any of these options, you should nail the channel a maximum of every 8 to 12 inches, positioning the nails in the center of the slots. Do not nail tight. Leave about a 1 32nd of an inch gap. In most cases, you are not required to install a receiver onto the fascia board. You must cut vinyl soffit panels to fit the span. If the span is more than 16 inches, you must use intermediate nailing strips to reduce the span and prevent sagging. Always follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Measure from the wall to the fascia board. Subtract one half of an inch to allow for panel movement. Mark this measurement on the panel. Use tin snips, a circular saw with a fine-toothed plywood blade installed in reverse direction, or a vinyl siding blade to cut soffit panels.
Insert the panel into the receiving channel while checking that the panel is square. Then nail the other end into the fascia board. When turning a corner, you usually install a transitional channel to receive mitered panels. In some cases, where adjacent soffits are different dimensions, you must make a square corner. You can use back-to-back J-channel, a factory-formed H-divider, or a field-formed aluminum T-channel. With all these options, make sure the channel system is securely attached. Now, miter the soffit panels and install. You can also field bend the soffit panel at the peak of the gable. At the peak of the gable, use back-to-back J-channel to make the transition. Fascia covers can be factory-formed vinyl or aluminum. However, they are usually field formed from aluminum trim sheet on the portable field brake. To field form a fascia cover, measure the board to be covered. Keep in mind that the formed fascia has to cover the edges of the soffit panels. Form the desired shape. Make sure to include a hem to eliminate waviness of the trim coil. Now install the formed piece onto the wood fascia. In most cases, the top of the fascia cover slides behind a roof drip edge. If a drip edge is not present, utility trim can be installed to receive the fascia cover. In these situations, you can snap lock lugs into the fascia panels. To install aluminum fascia, pre-drill nail holes a maximum of every 24 inches, aligned with the V-shaped groove in the soffit. Never nail trim sheet tight to the wood surface. If more than one length of fascia is required, overlap two pieces to ensure a smooth appearance. When overlapping fascia, make sure to overlap them a minimum of three quarters inch. When installing vinyl fascia covers, always follow the manufacturer's installation instructions. An F-channel must be installed onto the bottom of the fascia board. Cut one and a half inches of the lip and overlap by three quarters of an inch. At inside and outside corners, overlap tabs a minimum of one inch and miter the bottom of the fascia so that the finish area is attractive. Where a horizontal eave transitions to a gable or rake, framing must be installed to support a bird box. Create a bird box out of trim sheet or a vinyl fascia cover. Install the bird box as a fascia cover for the eave. The eave and rake fascia covers are installed after the bird box. Section 6, Replacing Installed Siding and Accessories. In this section, we will cover replacing siding and replacing corner posts. Sometimes vinyl siding panels must be replaced due to damage, inspection, or other reasons. To start, slip a Ziploc tool behind the bottom of the panel above the one to be replaced and unzip it. Now, gently bend out the upper panel. Take the nails out of the damaged panel and remove it. Now lock on the new panel and nail it in place. Use the Ziploc tool again to zip the upper panel over the lock on the new panel. You can replace a damaged corner post with a series of cuts. Cut away the face of the damaged corner, leaving the nail hem intact. Remove the nail hem from the replacement corner and trim it to fit. Place the new corner over the nailing hem of the old one and fasten it into position. This concludes a general introduction to installing vinyl siding. For more information, consult VSI's Vinyl Siding Installation Manual, available online at www.vinylsiding.org. For more information on VSI's Vinyl Siding Product Certification Program or Certified Installer Program, visit VSI's website at www.vinylsiding.org. For more information about the ASTM standards mentioned in this video, visit www.astm.org.